Firstly, thank you very much for coming along today. It's really appreciated, and hopefully we're going to have a quite exciting day of talks for you. I'm going to talk about work I'm doing here at the Open University with Professor Barry Jones, who, if you watch the old style OU programmes, you may see as this wizened Welsh guy with a big bushy beard, who's now quite an old Welsh guy. Um, he's been at the OU forever, and is probably older than this building. Um, <laughs> has been here for longer than this building, for certain. But the work I'm doing with Barry is looking into an idea that is very prevalent through the public understanding of astronomy and also through the way academics view the world. And the two don't often match up, but in this case they do. And it's this idea that Jupiter may have acted to protect the Earth over the course of our evolution from impacts, from things that would threaten to wipe us out. And we're looking into whether that's actually true or not. In terms of the layout of the talk, the structure, I'm going to start out right at the basics, so hopefully there's something for everybody in here. I'm going to go through, in a way it matches my own personal journey into astronomy, I'm going to start with the comets, which are the thing I find most interesting, the most fascinating. Move from there on to the other small things in our solar system, from that to discuss impacts, and then I'm going to talk about the work we're doing here. And the bit about the work we're doing here is only kind of the last, minutes of the, last few minutes of the talk. So, comets. I don't know how many of you will have seen a comet at some point in the past, but they're, they can be incredibly bright and incredibly spectacular. Eleven years ago now, there was Comet Hale-Bopp, which was visible for 12 months, something like that. So, everybody who went out on a clear night probably saw it. You may not have realised you saw it, but back in the days when people didn't have streetlights and televisions and playstations to distract them, comets were very obvious in the sky, especially the bright comets that you get maybe 10 per century of. And people didn't really understand the night sky going back hundreds and thousands of years. But they looked at it for clues to the future, for things that prophesied the weather, major events. And comets were something that came, appeared for a while and disappeared, so were viewed as portents or omens. Just to get that across, to get a feel for the awe with which people viewed these things in the sky, I've got a couple of quotes from the olden days. This is from ancient Greece, about 200 years B.C., talking about a guy I've never actually heard of, Mithridates. But the quote says, Heavenly phenomena had also predicted the greatness of this man. For both in the year in which he was born and the year in which he began to reign, a comet shone through both periods for 70 days in such a way that the whole sky seemed to be ablaze. It's the kind of thing the entire public, everybody who's out and about on an evening, would see this and notice it as something unusual and something spectacular. Famously, Julius Caesar's death was marked by a bright, bright comet. And again, you have the quote, Among the divine portents, there was also the great comet. It appeared very bright for seven nights after the death of Caesar, then disappeared. The Romans viewed this as the spirit of the emperor rising to its exalted place in the heavens. And kind of, you know, Caesar's dead, but he's going away. We can still see his magnificence in the sky. In our own history, um, there's a very famous record of a comet. This object, I'll use a bright zapper, there is a representation of Comet Halley, which is probably the most famous comet, something everybody will have heard of. At the time of 1066 and William the Conqueror invading the island, Comet Halley was very brightly visible over the UK, over the entire planet, had a very good return that year. And everybody saw it, all the armies who were waiting for the battles were aware of this comet shining above them. And you can see some of King Harold's friends or minions pointing up at the comet in shock and excitement. Whether it played any role in the kind of psychology of the two armies, I don't know. But you can easily imagine the case where King Harold and his men were, this is a bad portent, this is a bad omen, the gods are saying that we're going to lose. And William the Conqueror's men were buoyed up by this message from the gods that they were in the right. And it's not long after this picture was taken, picture was drawn that King Harold got shot in the eye and everything went as we now know it. The Doomsday Book was written, this was sewn, woven together, and the comet was immortalised, that apparition of the comet. The scientific study of comets is a much more recent thing, and again comes down to Comet Halley. This is a lovely artist's impression of Comet Halley in 1910, when it came fairly close to the Earth and was particularly bright and spectacular. But Comet Halley's actually played quite an important role in how we understand comets to behave. So, this is Sir Edmund Halley. And he did a very impressive thing. Taking you back now to the late 1600s, when the whole scientific revolution was in its infancy. Just before 
1682, one of Sir Edmund Halley's friends, Sir Isaac Newton, had published a book called Principia Mathematica, which laid down the rules of calculus and whole new mathematical tools that people could use to examine the world around them. And it was using these tools that Halley made the breakthrough. Now, at the time, comets were viewed as definitely an astronomical ph phenomenon. People had realised that these weren't 80 kilometres up in the atmosphere anymore, just a very high cloud or something. They were definitely beyond the Earth, but it was thought that they were objects that came past the sun once, travelled in a straight line and then disappeared forever, went back to the celestial sphere, as it were. Sir Edmund Halley took a scientific approach and looked at things using Newton's great theories and looked back at 32 bright comets that had been observed in about the 300 years prior to him going through the catalogue. And he found something really startling. When he looked at how the comets moved across the sky and worked out what that meant about their motion through the solar system, how they moved between the planets, he found that the comets of 1531 and 1607 had moved in very, very similar ways. So similar, in fact, that he predicted that this was the same object coming back time and time again. Now, nowadays we kind of take that for granted. We know Comet Halley comes past every 76 years, almost as regular as clockwork. But at this time, this was truly revolutionary. And people just didn't quite believe it. He predicted that this comet, which he thought he'd seen a year or two earlier, would return once again in 1758. And through that year, by this point, people had taken on board the new work that was done by that point 70 years earlier and started looking. And they searched and they searched. And nothing was found until on Christmas Day of that year, 1758, a German farmer called Johann Georg Palitsch found the comet. And it really was an amateur astronomer just outside. He'd been tending the fields during the day and then he found Halley's comet and recovered it. And because Halley made this leap of faith and made this prediction that the comet comes back every 76 or so years, and that's why the comet's named after him. So from this point, it was well acknowledged that comets come back time and time again. But the prediction at that point is just they move on the same path every single time, and nothing changes. There's an inherent thing in humanity, it seems, that the base assumption is that the universe has always been how it is now and will always stay the same. And it takes a lot of motivation for people to realise that things can change dramatically on timescales slightly longer than the human lifetime or even shorter. And it's been the same through the study of objects in the solar system. One thing that really shook people, this is a really good example, was the discovery that comets can have their paths through the solar system changed and changed quite dramatically. So it's another little story. In 1770, Charles Messier, who's a very famous astronomer for putting together a catalogue of pretty fuzzy objects in the night sky, was in fact observing looking for comets. He put his catalogue together because he wanted a list of all the things that look like comets and aren't. So the Messier catalogue that amateur astronomers now use to find something really pretty to look at was Messier's little black book of annoying nuisances. <laughs> but he was looking around to try and find comets, and he found one in, on June 15, 1770, and it turned out to be something very, very unusual. The comet grew rapidly in the sky and brightened very, very quickly and shot very quickly across the sky, faster than people were used to comets moving. And when they did the maths afterwards and realised that this bright comet, bright enough to be seen all across Europe, all across the world, by people just out in the streets on an evening, and you didn't have to look for it, it was there looking at you kind of thing. Once they did the maths, they found out that this had approached within about two million kilometres of the Earth. Now that doesn't sound that close a miss, but it's still the closest recorded approach of a comet to the Earth in recorded history. And it's actually, in astronomical terms, very, very close. This came shockingly close. And as I said, it was a very, very, very bright comet, easily visible with an naked eye. So they did measurements and worked out how long it would take to move around the sun. And they found out that it was moving around the sun on an orbit that took only six and a half years. So every six and a half years, you should see this comet, regular as clockwork. But nobody had ever seen it before, which kind of startled people. People thought maybe it's something that has randomly brightened that was just not visible before because it's too faint. But when people actually looked and worked out where the comet had been in the past, they found out something truly remarkable. This is a plot of what would have happened. Comets move on very long egg-shaped orbits around the sun that are very elliptical. And the comet, Comet Lexel, was initially on an orbit that would have taken it a long, long way out 
taken thousands or hundreds of thousand years to complete one swing around the sun. But on its way in towards the sun, just before it came near the Earth, it happened to come close to Jupiter. And Jupiter's basically the big bully of the solar system. It's got a really strong gravitational field, and it can kick things and deflect them around and send them onto whole new strange orbits. So it came close to Jupiter, and Jupiter bent the path and captured it onto a much shorter orbit that only took it out about as far as the orbit of Jupiter, on an orbit that would take six and a half years to complete. The comet then fell inwards towards the sun and swung past the Earth very close, just missing, and then went back outwards, and on a six and a half year orbital period. So the obvious question then is, where's the comet now? Why don't we see this bright naked eye comet every six years? Well, the same thing happened. The comet going around the sun every six years, six and a half years, Jupiter goes around the sun every 12. The comet swung outwards, and by the time it reached here, Jupiter was now on the far side of the planet. So the comet just carried on. The next time around, though, by the time it reached here, Jupiter had completed the other half and was exactly where the comet was again. So it gave it another enormous kick and sent it flying probably out of the solar system forever. But the measurements we've got, the observations, aren't quite good enough to say exactly where this comet is now. But it's almost certainly somewhere way out in the depths of space, probably never going to come back to the sun. It's probably been thrown out of the solar system forever. So in one object here, and in one 12-year period, we've got an example of Jupiter throwing things into the solar system and then kicking them out again. And that's going to be a bit of a recurring theme later on. So they're comets, big bright things, very exciting, and everybody sees the really good ones, and you remember them. The asteroids are another group of small objects in the solar system that are quite famous but have a much less distinguished history. And the reason for that is they're fairly small. They don't, unlike comets, emit large amounts of gas and dust that can reflect the sun's light and make them brighter. And they tend to stay a fair way from the Earth. So they're fairly hard to see. In fact, there's only one asteroid that you can see with the naked eye. And that one, you really have to know where you're looking. It just looks like a star, and a very faint star at that. I want to take the story a little bit further forward now, to 1800. And this is just after the discovery of the planet Uranus. The whole world was abuzz with the idea that there could be new planets that had never been known before, and people were searching frantically to try and find the next big world out in the solar system. And at this point, a guy called Titus Bird came up with a mathematical relation between the distance of the planets from the sun. And he said, if this mathematical relation holds, there should be a planet between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter that we've never seen. And people started looking. And a group of people in Italy formed themselves together to form a group called the Celestial Police. And they went out with a large number of telescopes searching the sky. But while they were doing that, another Italian, um, Giuseppe Piazzi, who just happened to be looking at the night sky through his telescope, found the first asteroid, which is Ceres. And that's actually the biggest asteroid by far in the main asteroid belt. Or fist asteroid, as I've got there. Wonders of typos. The Celestial Police were a bit upset that they'd been beaten to the prize, but invited Piazzi to join them. And over the next five years, they found four more, three more asteroids, Pallas, Juno, and Vesta. And there things stayed for another 30 years or so, 30 or 40 years, until in 1845, the fifth asteroid was discovered, Astria. So a very slow start to asteroids being discovered. Does anybody want to hazard a guess as to how many are discovered every month now? A little bit higher than 50. More than 100. Currently, there are more than 5,000 asteroids discovered every month, and there are over 400,000 that are known. Now, part of, this re part of the reason for this is that as time has gone on, telescopes have become better and better designed, so we can see fainter and fainter things. In addition to which, nowadays, we have photographic equipment called CCD cameras, which are very efficient and can detect very faint objects very quickly. And there are also automated searches for these objects all around the world that scan the sky with an automatic telescope rather than with people looking through an eyepiece. And so the ability to discover these objects has increased almost exponentially. And um, the more we look, the more we find. So there's a lot of them out there. Which brings us on to small bodies. Both the comets and the asteroids are inherently small objects. They're not like planets, which are thousands of kilometres across. But the typical comet has at its core a dirty snowball, maybe 10 kilometres across, one kilometre across. And it's from that that the enormous cloud of gas and dust is expelled when the comet comes near to the sun. The typical asteroid's the same kind of size. 
the biggest asteroids are only maybe a thousand kilometers across and they go all the way down to meter size and millimeter sized objects they're small they're a lot bigger than us but they're still small and the small objects in our solar system can be broken down into two distinct types you've got the objects that are stable so they're moving around the sun in a place where they're not going to get stirred up and kicked around very often and they can stay there for as long as the solar system has been in existence and you've got the unstable ones like comet Lexel which are moving on orbits where they can encounter the planets, be kicked around and bullied and moved into different parts of the solar system. And one of the things I'm going to discuss in a moment is how these two types of objects are linked. But firstly, I'm going to show you the different reservoirs of stable objects and the different types of unstable objects we now know of. The first stable reservoir is one that everybody learns about at school. It's the asteroid belt. This is a wonderful artist's impression. It's very, very beautiful. It's also about as factually inaccurate as you can get, but it is very pretty. It gives you the idea, though. The asteroid belt is a zone of debris, some things up to 1,000 kilometres across, down to millimetre-sized, between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. It's where Ceres and Pallas and Juno and the other named asteroids in the main reside. If you were to fly through the asteroid belt, if you were fired through it, the odds are that you'd not come near enough anything to such a distance that you could see it with the unaided eye. The thing is, space is really big. Even though we know millions, potentially, of objects, we know 400,000 now, within 10 years it'll be a million. They're actually so widely separated that you can fire satellite after satellite, person after person, through the asteroid belt, and it's very unlikely any of you would ever come close enough to an asteroid to see it, unless you aimed at them. So it's quite dispersed, but I wanted to say that before I put on the plot I'm going to show in a moment, which is all the asteroids we know. Because if you look at this, it looks jam-packed. A little bit of explanation. What you're seeing here is, imagine you're looking down at the solar system from above. You've got the planets here, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter. The blue line just shows the path the planet follows around the Sun, the orbit of the planet. And the planets move around the Sun on pretty much circular orbits. Jupiter, for reference, is just down here. Every single green dot on here is a main belt asteroid. These are objects moving in the very stable reservoir. The two little blue clouds here that look like bunny ears are something called Trojan asteroids. And these are objects that are, again, stable, that move 60 degrees ahead or 60 degrees behind Jupiter in its orbit, have been there since the birth of the solar system, and the great majority of them would still be there if you came back in a billion years. You've also got a lot of red dots here, which I'll come on to in a moment, but the point here is the asteroid belt in general is very tightly constrained, but there's a lot of material in it, a lot of debris. So, here's just a little animation, which is running quite nicely, of how these things move over a couple of year period. You can see the closer you are to the sun, the quicker you move, and the further away you are, the slower you move. And you can see how the two, this just tells you about it, um, you can see the two clouds of the Trojan objects here moving round at the same speed as Jupiter, which will just appear up here in a moment. You can see lots of red objects in here again moving very quickly. But the green objects tend to stay within this band pretty much all their time. They're the asteroids. That's stable population number one. Stable population number two is similar to the asteroids, but is much further from the Sun. It's out beyond the orbit of Neptune, and it's for this reason that we only started discovering objects in this region 15 years ago, with the exception of one strange object called Pluto. Pluto is a typical trans-Neptunian object. But nowadays, we're finding more and more of these objects. So looking down at the solar system again, everything we looked at before was in the middle here. The two little bright blue areas are the bunny ears, the Trojan asteroids I showed you before. These objects here, the ones in red and the ones in white, are the trans-Neptunian objects. Now, at the minute, we only know a few hundred of these as opposed to the 400,000 asteroids. But that is because they're so much further away, so they're therefore fainter and harder to discover. The biggest of these, however, are much bigger than the biggest asteroids. Pluto is a good example. Oh, there we go. Pluto isn't the biggest trans-Neptunian object, but it's so big that for a long, long time people classified it as a planet. There's a lot of big things out here. The points you see in white are objects people call Plutinos, and they're objects that are very similar to Pluto in the way they move around the Sun. And the objects in red are a little bit more analogous to the asteroid belt. That's the main Edgeworth Kuiper belt. I won't go into it too much, but just want to show you a few features. Because we've only been observing these objects for 10 or 15 years, 
there's a lot of what we call observational biases in this plot. A lot of the features you see, like this big hole here, that doesn't mean there are no objects there. That's merely an area of space that we haven't been able to look for these objects in. That's looking out towards the middle of the galaxy where there are thousands and millions of stars and it's much harder to find small faint objects. Because these things take so long to go around the sun, they've not spread out, so we've got holes like that. We've got a similar one on the other side, which is also looking through the Milky Way. And we have long straight bits here where somebody's taken one very, very long photograph that finds very, very faint objects. And in that one photo, they found 10 or 20 objects. That's why they all line up in one direction, pointing back at the Earth. But you can see again, you've got this large disk of material out beyond the orbit of Neptune. Zooming much further out, we've got the third reservoir of pretty much stable objects, which is the Oort Cloud, and that's the source of most of the very bright comets we see. This is Comet McNaught, which was spectacularly visible, particularly from the Southern Hemisphere in January 2007. It was a very, very bright comet. It wasn't so good from the UK, unfortunately, and the weather kind of conspired against us as well. Everything you just saw in the previous part, the orbits of the planets Pluto and the Kuiper Belt, is in an area smaller in the middle here than the size of the pointer that I'm using to show you it, to give you an idea of the scale here. The Oort Cloud is truly enormous. It stretches out to roughly halfway to the nearest star, so far away that light from our own sun takes two years to reach the objects at the outer edges. It's enormous. It probably contains, and I say probably because we've never actually had a direct observation of it because things are so small and so far away, but it's thought to contain about 10 trillion comets. That's 10,000, thousand million, I think. Or there may be some more thousands in there. It's an awful lot of objects, from things a few metres across again to possibly even objects the size of our moon or even the Earth, made of ice, held in cold storage. You remember me saying space is big. To give you an idea of how close together these objects are, you've got 10,000, thousand million of them, but they probably never come closer to one another than the planet Earth does to the planet Uranus, which is 18 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So even though there are so many, space is so big it can hold them easily. Most of these objects float around forever, staying halfway to the nearest star and mind their own business. So it's a stable reservoir, but some of them do get nudged inwards, and I'll talk about those in a moment. So those were the stable objects. Probably more fun are the unstable objects, because they do weird things like fly around and hit planets. And this is a really lovely photo of very small unstable objects, the sizes of grains of dust or grains of sand, that hit the Earth's atmosphere and burn up to produce shooting stars, to produce meteors. And this is an image of a meteor shower coming from the constellation Leo, called the Leonids that happens every November and was very spectacular a few times in the last 10 years. So unstable objects. Stable ones hang around, don't get perturbed by the planets, mind their own business. The unstable ones are, can swing close to the planets and be interesting and threatening. And the first group of these I want to talk about are the near-Earth asteroids. And the fact that it says near-Earth gives you a bit of a clue what's going to happen here. You remember the big plot with a big green disk of asteroids. We've zoomed in now, so this is the inner edge of the asteroid belt. And every one of these red dots is a near-Earth asteroid. And they're moving very chaotically, swinging in and out around the planets, getting nudged about. When you watch the video, you probably saw that they tended to cluster around the Earth. You had a big red clump that tended to follow the Earth, and things would swing into it and swing out of it. That's another of these observational effects. It's much easier to discover things when they're closer, so they appear brighter in the sky. But what I want you to take away here is that there are hundreds of objects made of rock crossing the Earth's orbit, coming close to the Earth, and potentially hitting us. The biggest near-Earth asteroid we know of is called Ganymede, and that's 36 kilometres across. So that's the kind of thing that, if it hit in the UK, would probably leave a crater the size of the UK. There's something that we do want to look for. That's the unstable population number one. It's a bit like Blind Date. We've got the different contestants. We've got contestant number two, the long-period comets. The near-Earth asteroids were related to the asteroid belt. The long-period comets are tied into the Oort cloud. So again, we've got another nice picture of Comet McNaught here. Long-period comets are a bit different to Comet Halley, which comes around every 76 years. These move on paths that take them hundreds of thousands or millions of years to go around the Sun. This just gives you an idea how crazy and egg-shaped their orbits are. 
you've got again Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and it's such an old picture that people still call him Pluto a planet. And you've got the orbits of some of the planets, some of the comets. Comet Halley, which as we know takes 76 years to go around the Sun, goes all the way out to just beyond Neptune. Haikataki and Hale Bob were the two comets that were really bright in 1997. Hale Bob takes about two and a half thousand years to go around the Sun. Haikataki takes about 20,000 years. Comet West, I think, was a million year period, and Comet Kahootek was unbound. It came through the solar system and was kicked out and would never come back. So these things go way, way out and take a really long time about it. But when they can pass us, they generally provide the brightest and most spectacular and certainly the most unexpected comets. So if they take 10,000 years to go around the sun, we've got no record of their last appearance. We've got, in addition to the long period comets, we've got the short period comets. Things like Comet Halley would be a very good example. These are things that come back around on the same kind of time scale as our lifetimes. Comet Halley's actually got quite a long orbital period for a short period comet. A better example is Comet Enki, which is the second comet to get a number, the second one we knew to be periodic. And that goes around the sun once every three and a third years. It's very occasionally bright enough to see with the naked eye, but most of the time people have to use telescopes or binoculars to observe it. But that goes around time and time and time again. And we actually encounter some of the debris from Comet Enki in around October and November every year making the torrid meteor shower, which if you're very lucky on a clear night, if it's clear tonight, you might see one or two torrid meteors, and you're seeing little fragments of that comet. We can split these into two types. We've got Halley types, which strangely enough are comets that are like Comet Halley, ones that take a little bit longer, tens of years typically, to orbit the Sun, and these are found to be on fairly stable orbits. People have observed Comet Halley. There are confirmed observations dating back to about 240 BC, and observations that were pretty certain of Comet Halley dating back to two and a half thousand years ago. So these come back time and time again on fairly stable orbits. You've also got the Jupiter family comets, and the name, again, shows you a bit where I'm going with this talk. These are objects that are under Jupiter's control. When they're at their furthest from the Sun, they're about where Jupiter is in the solar system, but they're dropping towards the Earth. A good example of a comet like this would have been Comet Lexel we spoke about earlier. You remember the thing that was captured by Jupiter and put onto the orbit where it nearly hit us. Comet Enki is a good example of this. This object here, the very peculiar comet that looked like a jellyfish last year, um, Comet Holmes, is a Jupiter family comet. And there are three or four hundred of those that are currently known, and more have been discovered as telescopes get better. Well, where do the short period comets come from? We've said the long period comets come from the Oort cloud, and we've said that the near Earth asteroids come somehow from the main belt, from the stable region. You've got one stable region, one stable reservoir and a small number of objects being disturbed from it to fall in to form a population of unstable objects. Where do the short period comets come from? Well, the answer to this steps through objects that I'm particularly fond of called the centaurs. Going back to our view of the outer solar system, we've got Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune here. And in this space here you'll see there are a lot of orange triangles and some of the purple dots and purple circles. These are centaurs. These are objects that never come closer to the Sun than the orbit of Jupiter, but always come closer than Neptune, and so they can cross one or other of the planetary orbits. And if they can cross the planetary orbits, in general, eventually, they'll come near enough to the planet for it to give it a kick and to be sent onto a different orbit, onto a different path. And it's thought that these objects are the direct parents of the short period comets. They move inwards and outwards, being kicked around by the planets until Jupiter gets hold of them and throws them into the inner solar system, where they become visible as a bright comet. The biggest centaur we know of is about 300, 400 kilometres across. So you can get objects, very, very, very big comets. hale bob which was the brightest comet for a century, was only 25 kilometres across in the middle. Imagine something ten times as big. It would be incredible. Um, we probably wouldn't be that happy for something like that to be thrown into the inner solar system, though, because it would mean it could hit us, and we wouldn't want that to happen. But they're there, they're floating around, and they probably come in from the Kuiper Belt. So you see a scatter down, Kuiper Belt to the centaurs, to the comets. Anyway, that's enough kind of talking about the different populations. Let's move on to the Earth and look at the direct result of objects like this. This is a pretty nice artist's impression of what would happen if something fairly big hit the Earth. You've got the planet there, a giant shockwave spreading out just after impact, huge amount of material being thrown up into the air, and certainly anyone hanging around down here is going to be having a bad day at this point. <laughs> but 
this isn't science fiction. Everywhere we look, there are holes in the ground. This is probably the most famous. This is the Barringer Impact Crater in Arizona, also known as Meteor Crater. It's a small impact crater as impact craters go, and it's very young. It's only about 50,000 years old. But to give you an idea of the scale of this small crater, the height from the edge of the rim to the bottom there is about 400 metres. And that far wall is about 1.2 kilometres, just under a mile away. It's a fairly big hole. And this was probably caused by a piece of rock or a piece of iron the size of a football pitch that hit Arizona 50,000 years ago. It's one example. And this played a very big role in the final realisation that impacts, that these kind of craters are caused by impacts rather than volcanoes, which was a prevailing view for centuries and, again, was a hard view to shift. This is another lovely example. This is up in Canada, this crater called Manicoagan. Whereas the previous one was 50,000 years ago and pretty small, this is about 200 million years old and pretty big. This inner rim, filled with the lake, is about 60 kilometres across. The outer rim out here is more like two or 300 kilometres across. This crater is so big that if you go onto Google Earth, you can pretty much see it without zooming in. If you look at photos of our planet, you can see it. And it's a really good example not only of things coming in from space and digging big holes, but of human ingenuity. Because this lake here is produced by a dam down here. And the Canadians, with infinite wisdom, dammed the crater and are now using it to produce a significant amount of their country's energy through hydroelectric power. So things hitting us aren't always bad. Where are the craters? This is a picture which uh, tells you a lot about the science of looking for craters as well as where the craters are. The bigger the dot, the bigger the crater. And you can immediately see quite a few features. If you look at the oceans, there aren't many craters there. And the reason for that is twofold. Firstly, it's a lot harder to look for things when they're under a few kilometres of ocean. But the other thing is, water is surprisingly effective at stopping those things that hit the earth, leaving a crater. Um, I talked to a girl who was doing a PhD in London, and she was doing really cool experiments where she had a big gas gun that fired marbles at five kilometres a second into targets to see how the craters would be formed. But she fired it through water at the targets. And she found you only needed three or four times the size of the projectile's depth to stop it from leaving a hole on the bottom. So you don't need much water to stop it leaving a crater. This doesn't mean things don't hit the oceans, but what you probably get, something hits the ocean, you get huge tsunamis. We're talking tsunamis a kilometre high, travelling faster than the speed of sound, sweeping away from the impact site, but not any crater to find, unless the impact is so big it can punch through the water. You then see certain areas of the planet have more craters than others. Part of that is down to the ease to get to those places. You can get out into the middle of the Canadian plains far more easily than you can go searching in the Brazilian rainforest. Part of it's also to do with how old the bit of crust you've got is. If you've got very new land, like in Iceland, you don't have craters because they've not had time to get craters. If you've got very old land, like in the Canadian plains, you've got a long record, and those craters that haven't been weathered away by wind and rain, plants and people digging them up, they're still there, you can record them. You've also got this, which is Scandinavia. That tells you a lot more about scientists than it does about impacts. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't go on holiday to Scandinavia. <laughs> Make that clear. What this shows you is that there's a very active group of people in Scandinavia looking for impact craters. And the whole thing about looking for these things, while it's great fun to go to Africa or to Australia, it's a lot cheaper to look for craters near where you live. So they've been very active and they've found lots of big and small craters around there. So in reality, the crater history of the Earth everywhere would look a bit more like that than like this. But to get a better feel for how the Earth should look if you didn't have weathering, we can look at the Moon. The Moon's right next door, so it probably gets hit as much as we do. But the difference with the Moon is you don't have weathering to wipe the craters out again. And everywhere we look on the Moon, you've got big craters, very new craters that have thrown out rays of fresh material onto the surface of the Moon. If you zoom on in, you get craters inside craters, craters overlapping craters. Everywhere you look on the Moon, it's been hit. And it's not just been hit once, it's been hit time and time and time again. This is Mars. I won't say too much about this other than its beautiful photo, because this is more Doug's realm, and if I say too much about this, he'll tell me off. But it just shows you the kind of quality of cameras we've got 
now. Everywhere you look, these craters, this is only a couple of hundred meters across? 800. 800. It's a tiny little crater, but show you the resolution. I think that's the right little speck. Do you see the speck just above my pointer? That's one of the Mars rovers driving around on the surface. But on this kind of scale, 800 metres, on Mars where the weathering does happen but slower, one, two, three, four, five, six, craters everywhere. Craters aren't something that's historic either. Um, for those of you who were around in 1994, we actually saw a comet crash into a planet, a um, comet called Schumacher Levy 9. It was discovered a couple of years before it hit as this incredible broken-out string of pearls in the sky. And what happened was, just before it was discovered, the comet had swung very close to Jupiter, been captured and been torn apart. And instead of just being one comet, there were 23 big bits and lots and lots of little bits. And all of the big bits, one after the other, in single file, crashed into Jupiter over the course of a fortnight in July 1994. And here's the results. This is afterwards, this is a bit after the impacts had happened. To give you a sense of scale here, the largest lumps of the comet that were left were probably a kilometre across. Jupiter's the biggest planet in the solar system, so the great red spot here is twice the diameter of the Earth. You could fit two Earths side by side there. Look at the size of the scars that were left by the impacts. This astounded everyone. The scientists who made predictions beforehand said, we'll see something, but it won't be that much. No, you had scars on the planet, dark areas where dust was spread over the clouds, bigger than the Earth. This took everybody totally by surprise and was really cool. I was 16 at the time and remember standing outside looking through a telescope, watching these things move around Jupiter. It's incredible, really spectacular to see. But it did shake people up and it helped people realise that impacts are something we really should be thinking about. Very recent picture. The European um, NASA sorry, have sent a mission to Mercury called Messenger and it's currently just flown past the planet Mercury, and it's been captured. So eventually, next year, it'll move into orbit and give lots and lots of really exciting data. But this is a photograph that was taken just a few weeks ago of the planet Mercury, the planet closest to the Sun. And what do we see again? Hundreds and hundreds of craters. It's really everywhere we look in the solar system without fail. If there's a surface that there could be craters on, they're there. There's something that's played quite an important role for us, I think, it's commonly believed that the dinosaurs um, were wiped out by an impactor. It's not the only idea out there, and it's quite probable that if you talk to geologists, they'll tell you it wasn't an impact that did it. It was big volcanic eruptions in India. Give us more money, we'll go to India and investigate it. If you talk to astronomers, we'll say it was definitely an asteroid. Volcanic eruptions weren't important. Give us more money and we'll, you spot a theme. In reality, it's probably a combination of many different things that did for the dinosaurs. This is, if you imagine, looking at the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, just after a giant rock 10, 15 miles across ploughed into the surface on the coast, left a really big hole in the ground. If you'd been there a few days, a few weeks earlier, you might have seen something like this, um, briefly. Um, this shows kind of dual nature of impacts from our point of view. Yes, it can be very devastating, very dangerous, and certainly... If you were anywhere near a big impact, you wouldn't want to be. Um, the idea that people have currently is that if a rock just one kilometre across hit the Earth, a quarter of the world's population will be wiped out like that. So it's something to be worried about. But on the flip side, if the dinosaurs hadn't died out, they'd probably still be here and we wouldn't. Um, which might mean we'd be having this discussion and be dinosaurs, but <laughs> they've played an important role. And it's something we do need to remember. So that's all background. What I want to talk about briefly now is the work I'm doing here. And this idea that Jupiter has played an important role in our own evolution by stopping the Earth getting pummeled, by stopping impacts like that that wipe the dinosaurs out, happening so frequently that life couldn't evolve. And I think this quote sums it up beautifully. This is from a web resource for teachers that I found. And it says, eventually... Jupiter's immense gravity caused it to act as a shield for the Earth, protecting Earth from being overly bombarded. Without the particular size and placement of Jupiter, Earth would still be subjected to intense pummeling by asteroids and comets, and life may not have been able to develop as it did. Something I got taught when I was at school, something I've seen on Horizon programs and equinoxes, and something that scientists, when I go to conferences, still say. This is hugely widely held. 
But where does the idea come from? How can Jupiter shield us? Well, with Schumacher Levy 9, and this is a beautiful artist's impression of how it would have been to see one of the comet fragments crash into Jupiter while another was still on course, we saw one way that Jupiter can be a shield. If things hit Jupiter, they've gone, and they can't then go on to hit us. More importantly, and a bigger role that Jupiter has is going back to the case of Comet Lexel. Jupiter is the single most efficient thing at throwing objects out of our solar system forever, sweeping things up. So the idea is that Jupiter goes around and anything that's on a threatening orbit, Jupiter says, don't like you, grabs it and throws it out of the solar system forever. That's how it can act as a shield. But we saw earlier on with the case of Comet Lexel that it doesn't just act as a shield. We saw this comet that would have been harmlessly minding its own business thrown to produce the closest ever near-miss from a comet to the Earth. So that was thrown our way by Jupiter. So it's finding out whether it acts as a shield or as a threat is a case of finding out which side of the scales is more heavily weighted. And that's what we've been trying to do. On the side of Jupiter being a threat, all of the near-Earth asteroids that we see, all of the Jupiter family comets we see, are put into the inner solar system with a few exceptions, by the effects of Jupiter. So it's obviously having a significant effect still at the current day of putting things our way. So, to recap slightly, we've got three different populations of potential impactors, which are our three sets of unstable objects. If they're unstable, they can be thrown our way and can hit us. We've got the near-Earth asteroids, which are born from the asteroid belt, Asteroids minding their own business in the asteroid belt can run into one another and chip bits off, crash, totally dismantle each other, and all the fragments fly out in different directions. It's stable from the point of view of if nothing hits them, they can stay there forever, but they can run into each other. And these fragments can be put onto orbits where eventually they reach Jupiter or reach the influence of Jupiter and can be moved in to become the near-Earth asteroids. We've got the Jupiter family comets, which are the daughters of the centaurs and the granddaughters of the stable reservoir just beyond Neptune, the Edwards Kuiper belt, the trans-Neptunian objects. And then finally we have the long period comets, again Comet McNaught in the background here looking really spectacular. And these are generally swung in from the arc cloud by the effect of passing stars kicking them around, or by the effect of the tide from our galaxy. Much as our moon rises tides on the Earth, and you get high tide and low tide at the seaside. The galaxy has the same effect and pulls the comets in the oak cloud around and can deflect them inwards or outwards. So you have each of the three unstable types of object directly related to three stable reservoirs. And just like a dam, like the dam we saw on the Manicoagan crater, you can have a huge reservoir of objects or of water and just have a slight trickle coming out of the dam at all times. So you always replace the unstable objects with new unstable objects as they're cleared out, but it doesn't really have any dent on the huge amount of water or objects held behind the dam. The reservoir can keep supplying us forever. So, in order to look at whether Jupiter is a threat, we wanted to look at each of these different groups of objects in turn to see what effect Jupiter has on the asteroids, what effect it has on the comets. And in order to do that, because they're very different types of object, we went to it with a different technique. For the asteroids, we chose to do those first because the near-Earth asteroids are thought to be the main threat to the Earth at the minute. About 75% of impacts on the Earth at this epoch are thought to come from near-Earth asteroids. So that seemed the obvious place to start. What I do here at the OU, I use a computer program that takes input of the planets and lots of small objects like comets and asteroids and simulates how the solar system moves over time. It works out where all the planets are, where all the objects are, works out everything that's pulling on them to see how their speed changes as they're pulled around, then steps forward a very short length of time and does it again, steps forward, does it again. And this allows you to work out for every object in the simulation where it will move over time under the influence of the planets. So we wanted to set up asteroid belts and see how Jupiter stirred them up, really. And we wanted to look at how, when you change the mass of Jupiter, when you make it bigger or smaller, that affects the shielding. Now, if Jupiter's a shield, you'd expect that the bigger Jupiter is, the fewer things would hit the Earth. If Jupiter's a threat, you'd expect the bigger it is, the more things would hit the Earth. So that's what we wanted to check. Now, unfortunately, the asteroid belt we know today has been shaped by Jupiter hugely. So we can't just take the asteroid belt without Jupiter 
and put it into a simulation with a totally different Jupiter, because that wouldn't be fair. With a different Jupiter, it would have evolved to look totally different to how it does now. So we had to set up instead unperturbed asteroid belts, imaginary disks before the planets formed. Just to illustrate that, don't have many graphs in here, but this is just the distance from the Sun against the number of asteroids known at that distance. What I want you to take from this is there's a lot of structure. You've got big peaks, big gaps, and all of these features, the gaps and the peaks and these extra spikes outside, are the result of the particular Jupiter we have now and its influence on the asteroid belt we have over the last four and a half billion years. Looking at that in a different way, this just shows how stirred up the asteroid belt is. But you can see again, big gaps. Areas where there are lots of asteroids and areas where there are none. So Jupiter's had a really big major effect over the last four billion years in making the asteroid belt very unique and very distinctive. If you had a different Jupiter, either in a different place or a different size, it would look nothing like that nowadays. So we had to get around that. So what we did was we set up our unperturbed belts in simulations where we made little Jupiters, medium Jupiters and big Jupiters. Jupiters ranging from 1% of the mass of the current Jupiter up to Jupiters twice as big. We put the Earth in because we wanted to know what hit it, and we ran with Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, because they're the biggest things that stir things up other than Jupiter. And we ran the simulations for 10 million years and counted simply how many objects hit the Earth. Now, given the computing power we have, these simulations took 13 years of computer time spread over a number of computers. And even then, we could only look at 100,000 asteroids. Now, over the course of the solar system, there have been far, far more than that. So in order to get a reasonable number of impacts, we had to do a little trick where we inflated the Earth and made it bigger. Imagine you're playing darts and you're blindfolded. If you want to hit the dartboard, you can move closer or you can make the dartboard bigger. We made the dartboard bigger just to get a reasonable number of impacts so we could compare things. So, the results. Before we get the proper results, here's just a couple of example graphs showing you the kind of things you'd see. You have, on the plot you're about to see, the proper one, the number of impacts increasing there, so 10, 20, 30. The mass of Jupiter increasing here to the right. And if Jupiter's a friend and shields us, you'd expect the number of impacts to fall as the mass of the Earth increases. If Jupiter's a threat, you'd expect the line to go the other way. The bigger Jupiter is, the more impacts you'd see. Fairly simple. So what we expected was we'd have one of these or the other of these. What we got was this plot on the left. You can ignore this just for a moment. This is the equivalent for the asteroid belt that we actually got. And what we found was that our Jupiter's about here. If you make Jupiter bigger than our Jupiter, the impact rate starts to fall a bit, which indicates Jupiter at the size of our Jupiter, you make it a bit bigger, it shields us a bit more. But if you go down to about the mass of Saturn, about one third the mass of Jupiter, the impact rate from the asteroids is about doubled. So a smaller Jupiter is more of a threat. If you go even smaller, when you have no Jupiter at all, you barely have any impacts from the asteroids, which shouldn't have surprised us. It did a bit, but it shouldn't have done, because if Jupiter's not there, you've nothing to stir the asteroid belt up. You've nothing to move the collisional debris that's formed from the asteroid belt to the Earth. It makes sense, but the main reason that peak is where it is is down to the structure of the asteroid belt you get evolving, which is what we're showing here. The top one is the case when Jupiter is the size of our Jupiter. The bottom one is the case when Jupiter is a quarter of that mass. And this is the same kind of plot, the number of asteroids against distance. And with our Jupiter, this is pretty much the structure you saw on the earlier slide, with quite a few gaps and a few little peaks, but not much there. But when you have a quarter of a Jupiter, the asteroid belt has a big, big whopping hole in the middle. Which means that anything put in that hole can get thrown out of the asteroid belt very quickly, which is why there's a hole, and thrown towards the Earth. So we think that's actually the main reason that this peak is so high, and it is where it is. Because with a smaller Jupiter, you'd have a hole carved in the middle of the asteroid belt. So the asteroids, big surprise, but we thought, got to move on, see what happens in the next population. So we looked... We were next interested in looking at the short period comets. Now, the Jupiter family comets, as the very name suggests, are under the control of Jupiter. And if you change Jupiter around, just as with the asteroid belt, you probably wouldn't have the same Jupiter family comets with a smaller or bigger Jupiter than you do now. So directly taking the Jupiter family comets and copying them across wouldn't be fair. So we started with their parent population, the centaurs. We chose the centaurs that were always well away from Jupiter, so they've not met it yet. 
as a way of finding those that haven't encountered the planet, and so therefore if you change the size of Jupiter, they'd still be how they are now. And we searched through the list and we found that we currently know 105 objects that you could call centaurs or scattered disk objects that cross the orbit of Neptune and approach Uranus. They're fairly far out. Within that list, we have Pluto. And we wanted an even number, but to be fashionable, we chose to ignore it. That gave us our 104 objects, and it kind of follows the way that everything's been going. A more reasoned thought for that is that Pluto is actually on a very stable orbit. It crosses the orbit of Neptune by some fluke, but will never come close to Neptune, so will never be stirred up. So we didn't need it in our sample. It wouldn't tell us anything. So we had 104 objects. And for each of those 104 objects, we copied them 1,029 times, spreading them out through space. So you had a big clump of objects initially, spread out over millions of kilometres, around where that object is in our solar system, which gave us 100,000 objects again, basically. And then, again, we ran with a, different num you know, a number of different Jupiter masses and counted the impacts after 10 million years. And much to our surprise, we got the same kind of thing again. Um, to show you just how similar it looks, here's a plot from the asteroids. Rapid climb up to a peak at around a quarter of a Jupiter mass and then a fall away. The centaurs, so the short period comets, just look at the red dots, do pretty much the same thing. The fall away is more swift, and that's down to how the objects get from outside Jupiter to inside Jupiter. Basically, the bigger Jupiter is for the centaurs, the better it is at throwing objects our way, but once you make it big enough, it ejects them from the solar system so quickly that they don't spend that much time crossing the Earth's orbit. And again, you're thinking of Comet Lexel back in the 1770s, a great example of this. So the Goldilocks case here, or anti-Goldilocks, the case where Goldilocks put salt in the porridge and God knows what else, you have the most threatening case at around a quarter of a Jupiter mass. That's in this case because that's a mass where Jupiter can put things on Earth-crossing orbits fairly easily, but can't remove them again. And then as the mass goes up, it gets better and better at throwing them away. So they spend less time threatening us. So the chance of them hitting is lower. So two populations, totally what we didn't expect. What are we going to do in the future? Well, currently on the computers here at the OU, I'm running simulations to look at the long period comets, saying it was weather all right. When we look back through the scientific literature to try and back up this idea that Jupiter is a shield, you'd expect we'd find lots of studies saying it is. We found one. And that one study looked at just the long period comets. It didn't look at the asteroids or the short period comets. But it seems that for the long period comets, because Jupiter's so good at throwing things out of the system, it does act as a shield. We're now redoing that work just to confirm it, but my gut instinct is that weather all probably was right. Once we've done that, we're then going to start playing around with the position of Jupiter and see what effect the distance of Jupiter from the Sun has on how many things hit the Earth. That's kind of next year. And moving beyond that, there are planets being discovered all the time now around other stars. And there's a big question of whether there's life elsewhere. And obviously the impact regimes on those planets, how many things hit them, can play a critical role in determining which planets will have life, which won't. So we want an understanding of which systems are good for impacts and which ones are bad. So we're going to move on and look at all the different planetary systems that are discovered to try and get an overall view of whether giant planets in general are necessity for life or whether you're better off without them. One thing to think about before we go to questions with that, if you have no impacts at all, is that a good thing for life? If you never have something resetting the clock and letting new species evolve, we wouldn't be here. So maybe you want a Jupiter that's big enough to be some threat, but not so big that it's totally scary. And with that, I'll leave you and take questions. Thank you very much for listening. Um, Why are one all of the objects in the, the proximity of Jupiter unstable? Um, the question there was, why aren't all of the objects in the vicinity of Jupiter unstable? We're talking about the Trojan asteroids there, the blue little bunny ears. They're stable for the same reason Pluto is out near Neptune. They're in something called a mean motion resonance, which is a very posh way of saying they orbit the Sun with a ratio of Jupiter's orbital period, in this case one to one. So in the time it takes Jupiter to make one orbit around the Sun, they also make one orbit around the Sun. And so they always stay 60 degrees ahead or 60 degrees behind, and they can never come close to the planet. With Pluto, 
That's their belief in that crosses Neptune's orbit because in the time it takes Neptune to make three full revolutions, Pluto makes exactly two. So every time that Neptune reaches a point at which they cross, Pluto's either well ahead or well behind. So that's why they're stable. One point I forgot to mention earlier on, by the way, if you're asking a question, um, save me having to repeat it, if you could wait for the microphone to get to you and then ask it, that means the people filming actually get a record of it on there, and it means I don't have to repeat your questions. That's great. So, one right over there. And I'll remind you, Doug, that you're talking next, so I can get my revenge for this. I warned you it would be a challenging one. Um, <laughs> um, you mentioned that the, the asteroid belt was kind of, it was considered essentially to be a missing planet. Um, why isn't it a planet? And if it was, what would it be like instead? Right. When this, all, this goes back to when the solar system formed, and the current idea on how the planetary system formed is that there was a big disk of gas and dust, all moving on pretty much circular orbits, and the planets formed out of that. Now, the big giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, formed very quickly and kind of their gravitational influence can stir things up. And when you've got bits of dust and bits of rock and you want to form planets, you have to have them hit each other slowly enough that they stick. And the idea is that the material, any, anywhere a bit further out than Mars, out to the orbit of Jupiter, you can get enough stirring from Jupiter that while you're stable in your orbit, you can stay there forever. You get stirred up enough that instead of the impacts being very gentle, the speeds are much higher, and so the collisions destroy things rather than create them. And so the idea is because Jupiter formed so quickly and so large, it made everything, the collision speed higher. So instead of things sticking together, they got broken up and you stick with the asteroids. And the corollary of that is that the asteroid belt is continually grinding itself down. But we still have objects there that are hundreds of kilometers across. So initially there'd have been more of them. So if you think about it, as Jupiter was getting bigger and growing up, there was time for these things to accrete, to stick together and become bigger. Up until Jupiter got big enough to stir them up, and by this point there were a lot of things probably the size of Ceres, a thousand kilometres across. And since then, they've been grinding themselves down again because they got stirred up enough to be colliding and weathering away to just dust. Hello. I was just wondering, presumably the, any shielding effect which a very large planet had towards the outer edge of the solar system compared to the inner planets, it's going to be very similar in its effects on all the inner planets, the uh, Venus, Mars, and Mercury. Yeah. So presumably we would expect a similar amount of protection on those planets, yet we see very, very many impacts on all those planets. How do they compare with the number of impacts we see on the Earth, and to what extent could that, the difference be because of the atmosphere and, as you mentioned, the sea? Yeah, we've got a few effects there. Firstly, Mercury, the innermost planet, it's quite hard to throw things in that far anyway. But what happens with Mercury, Mercury has no atmosphere, so it's like the moon, there's no weathering. So anything that hits, the craters are there forever, unless something else hits on top. The same with the moon. So with those, we see pretty much a full impact history of those objects. Venus has an atmosphere much, much denser, much thicker than ours. So partly, some of the objects that hit the planet... It, you need a bigger impact to punch through the atmosphere. But also, weathering on the surface of Venus is incredibly efficient. Added to which, there is a theory that... You know on Earth we have plate tectonics, and that resurfaces a planet. Venus doesn't have that. It's a little bit too small, but it still has a lot of heat inside. And you have to ask how the heat gets from the inside out. How does Venus cool? And there is a theory which is a bit tentative, that whereas we get volcanic eruptions in localised places, Venus sits there quietly for 500 million years with heat building up inside until eventually the entire planet melts and resurfaces. And so that's another reason, if that's true, why we don't have impact craters there. Mars has m more atmosphere than Mercury and the Moon, but less than the Earth, so it has a better impact history there. And also it's nearer the asteroid, so it's a bit easier for things to get from the asteroid belt to Mars. So you'd expect to see more impacts there than the Earth, even though Mars is a bit smaller. I was just wondering that if you changed the size of Jupiter, yep. it obviously affects more comets' orbits. Yes. As the comets' orbits are affected, does that, do the comets not affect the asteroids? To some extent they will do. I mean, everything that there is from the smallest atom to the biggest star exerts a gravitational pull, and that gravitational pull is related to how big it is. Um, 
So therefore, every comet passing through the asteroid belt, if it comes close to an asteroid, will give it a little bit of a tug. But when they're very small, as comets are tens or hundreds of kilometres across, they don't weigh very much, so they don't have much gravity associated with them. They don't have much pull. I mean, I guess another way to look at it would be the deflection you get. We have sent the Voyager spacecraft out, and Jupiter gave those a kick to move them onto Saturn and so on. Voyager, the spacecraft, was tiny. Jupiter was very, very big. So Jupiter gave a huge change in speed to the spacecraft, but the spacecraft will have only given an absolutely minuscule change in speed to Jupiter. It's the equivalent if you're driving along the road in a tank and a fly hits your windscreen. It's a big thing for the fly, but not a big thing for the tank. And so for any individual comet coming through the asteroid belt, it won't really stir it up much at all. And the average effect would be averaging out, because some will pass in front, some will pass behind. What you would get, though, if you've got more objects going through the asteroid belt, you've probably got more collisions happening. So you might get the asteroid belt weathering down a little bit quicker. So that's one effect that it might have. Any more? Uh, I know you're a, a Jupiter man, but uh, does Uranus have any effect on this sort of thing? Because that's a pretty big planet. Yeah, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune will all also send objects our way, but because Jupiter's the biggest and also the nearest, it's most efficient. If we go back to the, hop back to the plot for the centaurs here, you see that even when Jupiter doesn't exist, you've still got some impact rate going on, a little bit lower than what we have today, but pretty comparable. That's primarily due to Saturn, and then to Uranus and Neptune as well. But you've got two things. You've got, because the more massive a planet is, the bigger kick it gives, so the easier it is to throw things inwards. And Jupiter is bigger than Saturn, which is bigger than Uranus and Neptune. So Jupiter has the biggest influence than Saturn, and then Uranus, then Neptune. But also, the further away the planet is, the further it has to throw things to reach us. Jupiter's nearer, Saturn's the next, then Uranus is. So that's probably the order of importance for them. Mars is near the inner edge of the asteroid belt, but it's absolutely tiny, so probably has very little or no effect on our impact rate, but probably gets hit a lot itself. That's probably its main influence on our impact rate, is things hit it instead. Um, if we do have more questions, we've got time for another one quickly, but coffee should now have arrived downstairs. Um, if we go down to coffee, I'm going to be wandering around. Feel free to grab me and ask me questions down there. We want to be back up in here by 4 o'clock for Doug's talk. So we've got the best part of 25 minutes now for coffee. And if anybody wants any more questions, I'll be walking around down there. Thank you very much.